Hey guys, James from the Flying Guillotine YouTube channel here. Going to be bringing you even more Ringo Lamb content just when you thought I was done. Uh, I have some more to bring on. Uh, already I've reviewed Full Alert, uh, School on Fire, City on Fire, Prison on Fire, Prison on Fire 2, um, and kind of given a Ringo Lamb retrospective where I talked about a bunch of his films and sort of gave my tiered list of how I personally place everything. But I wanted to, just while these things are fresh in my mind, wanted to just talk a little bit more about the uh, Incendiary on Fire trilogy, uh, which includes, of course, three films which I've already reviewed. So I'm going to try to give, give uh, you know, just some perspective on the trilogy as a whole, uh, because I think it's such a special and unique trilogy that I really think is underserved and undercovered. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I mean, in my view, at least, Ringo Lamb, uh, certainly of this period, kind of has this just very unique feel to him that, uh, and I would certainly classify him as sort of an auteur, having his own unique perspective and style uh, to the work that he has that stands out and is quite different from uh, just about any other filmmaker. And it's very much of this place in Hong Kong, specifically these three films, uh, 1987, 1988, when these movies came out, City uh, came out first, then Prison on Fire, both 1987, both tremendously successful, and then School on Fire, 1988, which, uh, you know, had a little bit less of a box office and a little bit more controversy surrounding it. So all really fascinating films. If you haven't seen them, I just, I'm going to be spoiling them. I just highly recommend you check out all three of them. I would probably watch them in that order too, even though my actual preference is kind of the reverse. School is my favorite, Prison second, and uh, City Third, uh, but I think they're all fantastic, and I think uh, they make a really, really interesting trilogy, uh, and I think they're rewarded uh, with just getting a little bit more familiarity with Hong Kong cinema and stuff like that. I think these are harder, uh, more challenging films than uh, often the just hyper-stylized uh, beauty that is the John Woo films of this era. Uh, Ringo Lam was very much not a John Woo uh, copycat or anything like that. He was definitely his own sort of thing. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that. So one thing, uh, and this is not the most deep thing I'm going to say, one thing I love about the films too is that these are just short films that are just really good and they just bring a lot of energy. Um, I've heard some people call these films a uh, little bit of slow burns. I don't think I agree. Um, for me, City on Fire actually has the most pacing issues. And even then, it, I do feel like these films move really fast. They're all run about 100 minutes. And for me, I love films that are in that 90 minute, 100 minute range. Um, I'm a big fan of genre films, so I think that's a really, really perfect time uh, just to hold your attention for um, you know a certain period and just hit home certain points and stuff like that. So I think these films are perfect in terms of uh, runtime and I think they are paced very well. And I think, you know, sometimes you watch these older films and there's a certain rhythm and they can be a little bit slower. We're in kind of our smartphone generation, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I think these films hold up wonderfully. I, I think these films uh, from start to finish uh, are have just a ton of energy um, and a lot going on with them. Uh, yeah, and, and probably the number one reason why I do love these films too is they have a message and there's social criticism baked into these, but it's done from kind of a genre point of view and perspective. These films aren't seeking just to send a message. Um, it's not, they're not dull at all. These are um, crime movies, they're thrillers, um, and they are seeking both to entertain, but they also have something to say. And for me, at least, uh, as a lover of genre cinema, that is definitely one of my favorite places to be in, um, as far as like having films that uh, are talking a little bit about the society that they're in and have that kind of like extra texture and, and depth to it, uh, but also are entertaining. Uh, like, I don't like uh, cinema that is uh, just like overly long for no particular reason. I, I don't know, call me what I am. Maybe I am the shallow person here, but I like films that are exciting and entertaining and doing it through a genre setting for me is uh, very I ideal. So I think these films are entertaining as hell. Uh, the social criticism, one thing that for me um, was a little bit challenging to get into at first uh, because I've seen all these films multiple times and School and Fire is probably the one that has grown the most in my estimation is 
the uh, point of view and the perspective they're doing is not particularly subtle or refined. And I think coming to these films on their own terms and the way that they are actually constructed, I think, is helpful. These are not trying to be indie dramas uh, and just have kind of like these cute, subtle points. Oftentimes, the social criticism is very much in your face. But being able to meet the film sort of on its own terms and what it's trying to communicate, I found to be very um, insightful. I think School on Fire is probably the most difficult t film to sort of just put in a box uh, of these three. And I think as a result, it's, it's kind of like the challenging one to digest, but I find it to be um, ever so rewarding if you can. So yeah, uh, that, sort of that idea of attacking institutions. I mean, literally that is in the title of these, City on Fire, Prison on Fire, and School. City is probably the most ambiguous from that, but it's sort of taking aim at uh, specifically criminal justice institutions of police, policing uh, in particular. Um, and one thing these uh, films do right from the get-go is all three have just this crazy sense of danger uh, that happens. And I think uh, it's very much intentional. Uh, Ringo Lam was credited as a writer in City, and his brother Nam Mien wrote uh, the latter two films. So very much uh, part of the creative process uh, from start to finish, at least someone in his family is. And City on Fire, we think about how that film opens. We start with an undercover police cop wearing this wonderful white sweater and he gets stabbed and we get like this great red on white. Um, and our main, main protagonist in the film is Chalian Fat, who is playing an undercover cop uh, who is basically under pressure uh, from all different sides and uh, he wants to quit the force, but he can't. Uh, and we just have immediately established that this job is dangerous. Um, and throughout the film, uh, Ringo Lam sort of critiques uh, sort of the institution, specifically police, uh, who clearly just don't have uh, Chalian Fat's best interests, specifically his health, at heart. And uh, it's a very, very dark, sweaty, gritty film. Um, probably the most conventional um, in some sense, just because it is kind of a cop film. And I think it's the one that on the surface sounds the most appealing. So I think as a result, it's not a bad place to start. But for me, I think it gets even more interesting when we get to move to prison and school. Prison uh, on Fire, also really interesting, um, just uh, great character work in all of these films. I think a lot of the characters are just really, really fully realized. I think this one has the best sort of, well, I mean, I'll take that back. Danny Lee and Chow Yun Fat are great in City on Fire. I think Chow Yun Fat's great when he's playing off other male actors in particular. Prison on Fire, he is equally great, playing off uh, Tony Leon Kafai Ka in a really, really uh, early role for him. And uh, they basically, uh, have a drama in the prison and the film uh even so it, it sounds mo the most drama -y, but even then in the first 10 minutes we have basically a really really brutal prison right and the film explodes at the end with just like this orgy of violence uh in the prison system so uh even that, so that film um also uh extremely violent uh extremely angry uh, and uh, it does not portray the prison system particularly well. Uh, so City on Fire, Prison on Fire kind of take an aim at the criminal justice system. Both of those films were uh, notably very, very successful, uh, nominated for multiple Hong Kong Film Awards actually in the same year. Uh, but uh, City School on Fire was much more criticized. It was a much more controversial film at the time that it was released. I think it made a lot less money than the other two. Don't have those numbers in front of me, but I believe it was less, less successful, only nominated for one Hong Kong Film Award for Best Supporting Actress, which it did actually win. So um, a lot more um, uh, dislike of that film uh, from the get-go. And I think it's probably because it is the angriest and it takes aim at institutions that we tend to hold uh, even more sacred, uh, specifically schools uh, and uh, the family institutions too. And what's so disturbing and critical about that film is just showing how easily the criminal elements of triads and stuff like that tend to integrate with the film. And I think it's the most unique of them, and I think it has uh, kind of the oddest structure of them. It's a very hard film to put into a box and just sort of define uh, what it is. Uh, the synopsis I pulled says a young schoolgirl becomes caught in triad activity after she testifies in court over a beating that results in the student's death. And yeah, that, that is true. That is true. Uh, and a lot of it covers kind of like the uh, impotence of the cops in terms of uh, intervening and actually protecting her and having justice be done, uh, as well as the school and the families. Uh, it is a very damning film. 
And I think that criticism, uh, to this day, uh, it goes down quite harsh. And for me, I find it to be very impactful. Um, so again, it's, it's not a subtle film uh, in, in here. Uh, the film basically ends with uh, Roy Chung's character becoming Michael Myers and needing everyone to just about gang up and take him down. And it's wonderful. Um, but for me, at least, it took a couple of viewings for that really to resonate. Um, because the way it has its social criticism is told from a very different way than you might be used to even from, from like a festival circuit film or something like that. Yeah, so I'd say the sense of violence that is just constantly simmering under the surface for me makes these films a little bit uh, more than a slow burn as far as pacing because they're often just very immediate uh, explosive uh, scenes of violence. Uh, these, this is not, certainly not a sedate drama. Um, yeah, uh, and, and I think that sense of danger and chaos is, an, is another thing that really defines Ringo Lamb. Uh, there's not, you're not going to have that same uh, extreme use of slow motion that you're going to get from someone like John Woo or, or directors that are trying to imitate John Woo at this time. Um, and his films often feel wild and often a little bit sloppy at points, almost in the best possible way. Ringo Lamb was only 31 and to 32 when he was making these films, so really, really young when these films were coming out. Um, and it really has that strong sense of energy. I don't think you're going to have this same very uh, pointed sense of danger and anger uh, from an older filmmaker in the same way. Um, and at the same point, I think that sort of like kinetic uh, spontaneity that you're getting from these films is very, very much unique to him uh, in the sense that the same sort of energy that makes these things film spontaneous and often even a little sloppy at points. Um, you're just not going to get if you have someone like uh, Kubrick or David Fincher doing 77 takes of someone like walking down into the subway or something like that. The sense uh, that of like physicality and stuff like that, I think is very, very much um, uh, kind of uh, just uh, very much of Ringo. So yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of what I wanted to say about these films. Um, I think they're all wonderful, and I think you should check out all three of them if you have not yet. Um, and I think it's too bad that uh, as his career went on, he this sort of social criticism didn't totally disappear. But I do think that these three films, uh, in particular School and Fire, are where it is uh, the most impactful and he has absolutely the most to say. If we think about how his career evolved, he moved into making uh, you know, a really tremendously inter entertaining film like Full Contact, which for me is kind of inter just very entertaining popcorn. I think it's a great film, um, but uh, I think the hard-hitting nature of these films uh, it just leaves more of an impact. So for me, School on Fire, absolutely one of my favorite Hong Kong films, just period. And Ringo Lam, I think he's a, a director that uh, is deserving of all the praise, and I think it is remarkable that uh, a young person at the time, 31, 32, so a good three or four years younger than myself, uh, could uh, just direct uh, direct the hell out of all of these films. So uh, if you want a sort of like um, another flavor from Hong Kong of the 1980s, and Hong Kong has so many wonderful flavors from the 1980s, then please do check out Ringo Lam if you have not already. Anyways, if you have seen these films, let me know what you think. Let me know what you thought of this, uh, this I'm not even sure what you call it, this, uh, this coverage of the three on fire films, and I will see you next time.